With this lesson, we are going to begin section 16 of the syllabus, which is all to do with system software, and then we're going to move on to translation software. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at how an operating system can maximize the use of resources, things like processor time, memory, input and output. And then we're going to be looking at how it hides all of that complexity that normally is associated with hardware through the form of a user interface. Things like through the use of a GUI, things like use of interrupt, and so on. And finally, we're going to be looking at process management. Processes are basically programs, and an operating system can manage it through the magic of scheduling to give you the impression of multitasking. Most CPUs can only deal with instructions at a time. Of course, they can process billions of instructions in a second. However, it's the job of the operating system to ensure that each of the programs that are running on your particular computer are given the right amount of time to ensure multitasking occurs. So to you, all the programs are running at once, even though they might be using the CPU for a limited amount of time per second. Now this is a very theory heavy topic and there is a bit of logic later on when we look at translation software in the form of BNF and RPN, reverse Polish notation and the Bacchus node form. However, to begin this particular section, you need to know a lot of key terms. And these will be referenced throughout the next couple of lessons as well. So make sure you understand them. As usual, pause the video and jot these down and then continue. Now a bootstrap is a small program that is used to load other programs to start up a computer. So BIOS, you all know about that. When a computer is started, the BIOS loads up, checks all the hardware, makes sure everything works, and then the bootstrap program loads and that allows the operating system or a part of the operating system to be loaded into the RAM. Scheduling is basically a process manager which handles the removal of running programs from the CPU and the selection of new processes. So which program should be given CPU time, which one should be in a waiting state, all of that is decided by the scheduler. The direct memory access controller is a device that allows certain hardware to access RAM independently of the CPU. Now, if you remember from the von Neumann architecture, the control unit uses a control bus to send signals to the various different hardware devices. And if those hardware devices need to access the RAM, they first need to let the CU know. And that means that the control unit can get overwhelmed by all of these other signals that are coming in. Okay, I want access to the RAM. I want access to something else. So to prevent that load, the DMA comes into play. And it simply says, well, okay, if you need to access the memory, go via me. And that acts as kind of like a personal assistant to the control unit and makes the processing manageable. So the CU can concentrate on the more important tasks. Now, an operating system has a core, and that core is called a kernel. And the kernel also operates like an access controller because it controls the process management, the memory management, the interrupt handling, device management, and I.O. or input and output operations for the application. So if an application wants to access any of these, it has to go via the kernel. Multitasking is basically the function of an operating system which allows a computer to process more than one task at a time. Process is basically a program that has started to be executed so you might have an application program. The moment it is being executed by the CPU, it is a process. Preemptive is a type of scheduling in which a process switches from a running state to a steady state or from a waiting state to a steady state and you preempt that. So this process will have this amount of time to run. The next one has to come up in the queue. So once this one finishes, it goes to the back of the queue and the next one comes up. And that time, that fixed time slice, is called a quantum, and that's allocated to a process in preemptive scheduling. Now, the next set of key terms are also on screen, so do pause the video once again and jot these down. And of course, if you feel like it, you can skip ahead to the main part of the lesson. Non-preemptive is another type of scheduling in which a process terminates or switches from a running state to a waiting state. We'll talk about these in due course. So if you're not sure what these states mean, We'll explain it later on in the lesson. Burst time is the time when a process has control of the CPU. So that means that the CPU is executing the instructions for that particular process. Starve is to constantly deprive a process of the necessary resources to carry out the task. 
just like starving in real life really. Low level scheduling is a method by which a system assigns a processor to a task or process based on the priority level. So you decide this task is a higher priority. For example, dealing with the system crash probably is a higher priority level than just typing text into a word processor. So your operating system will probably have some kind of low level scheduler that deals with the various processes it encounters. The PCB or the process control block is a data structure which contains all the data needed for a process to run. So priority level states, all of that information will be in the PCB. And the process states of course are running, ready and blocked, three main ones. These are the states of a process requiring execution. So either the process is running or it is ready to run or it's in the block state, for example, waiting for an input. It can't run or it can't even be ready to run because the input hasn't arrived yet. Round robin is a kind of scheduling algorithm that uses time slices assigned to each process in a job queue. We'll be looking at these algorithms later as well. And context switching is a procedure by which when the next process takes control of the CPU, its previous state is reinstated or restored. So think about it. If your process wasn't completely executed during its particular time slice, its state needs to be saved somewhere, basically the PCB, and then it goes into the waiting part. And when it gets its next turn, that state has to be loaded back up so you can continue from the last point of execution rather than start again. Hopefully that will make a lot more sense when we discuss this in a bit more detail later on. Okay, that's all for the key terms. Hopefully you've got all of these down. Let's begin with the main part of the lesson. Let's start by maximizing resources. As we know that a computer will always have a limited amount of resources. You're limited by the predefined bit limit, for example, a 64-bit processor, or you might have a limited amount of memory, for example, 16 or 32 GB of RAM. You might have issues with storage. You might have issues with access to a certain type of printer, which can only print a certain type of page, which can only print cert which can only print a limited amount of pages per minute. There's always going to be a limit because these resources are finite. So one of the main purposes of an operating system is to maximize resources. Now before we begin looking at how that works, let's look at the state of a computer system. So when we turn a computer on, the BIOS is loaded up first from a ROM chip and it checks all the hardware, make sure everything works, everything is fine, and then it starts off a bootstrap program. And this program loads part of the operating system into the main memory, which is RAM, from the SSD or the hard disk drive, and then it initiates the startup procedures. This particular process is a lot less obvious when you have devices like tablets or smartphones. They basically use RAM, and that RAM's operational speed is close to the flash memory that's on board those devices. And that means that it's loaded up almost instantaneously so you don't really see that Windows sign or that Mac OS sign that you see when you first boot up a computer. However, the bootstrap program does load up on all devices. Now, why is that instantaneous on mobile devices? That's because the flash memory that's on those devices is split into two parts. You have part one where the operating system resides. It's normally read only. Only the manufacturer can flash or update that particular part. So whenever you get an update from Google or Apple, that operating system is updated. This part is reserved and the user cannot steal memory from the operating system's reserved part. And this can range from 8 to 10 GB to perhaps 20 to 30 GB depending on the operating system and the device that you've got. The second part is where all the apps and the associated user data are stored and the user does not have a direct access to this part of the memory either. The access is via the operating system. Now the RAM is where the apps are executed and where the data currently in use is stored. So you can automatically see right now we've got three areas. You've got the CPU, you've got the RAM and you've got the flash memory. And these resources need to be managed otherwise applications and users can get very very greedy and they want to use perhaps the entire RAM for one particular application or the application wants to access the CPU all the time and that can eventually lead to crashes because you then cannot fit something else which is critical to the running of a computer system. So one of the most important tasks of a computer system 
So one of the most important tasks of an operating system is to maximize the utilization of computer resources. And this resource management can be split into three areas, the CPU, the memory, and the input-output system. Now this is an important piece of information, so make sure that you do remember this. So in an exam, when a question is asking about resource management, you need to talk about these three. Now resource management of the CPU basically involves the concept of scheduling, and that allows for better utilization of CPU time and resources. Regarding input and output operations, the operating system will then need to deal with any input-output operation which has been initiated by the computer user, any input-output operation which occurs while a software is being run, and resources such as printers or disk drives are requested. So think about this. You might have an I.O. operation where the user says, well, okay, I want to print something, and that needs access to the printer. And yet at the same time, the printer will probably send an input-output operation saying that it's run out of paper. So those interrupts that we're talking about are part of the input-output operation as well. How do you send data? How do you receive data from a particular input-output device? Are there two applications that are trying to print at the same time? All of that is handled by the operating system. Now the diagram on screen represents how a structure could be set up where the CPU and the main memory are accessible via the direct memory access controller and then all the other hardware devices are accessing the DMA through the use of their particular device drivers. Because remember, each hardware device is probably created by a different manufacturer and they need to write some software to allow access to that device for both receiving and sending data. Now the DMA can be part of a kernel or it can be a specific separate device and the reason you need that is because input or output devices, as you can see in the table on the bottom right hand corner, can operate at different data transfer rates. The CPU is operating at billions of bits per second perhaps, and the disk or the keyboard is operating at anything between 50 bits per second to 100 megabits per second. And that means that there's a lot of waiting going on at the CPU front to ensure that the right amount of data arrives so you can do something about that. So the DMA frees up the CPU to allow it to carry out other tasks while the slower input-output operations are taking place. The DMA initiates the data transfers. The CPU in the meantime carries out other tasks while this data transfer operation is taking place. And once the data transfer is complete, an interrupt signal is sent to the CPU from the DMA that, okay, it's ready to send it the data from the input-output device or perhaps receive data for an input-output device from the CPU. The operating system has a core which is known as the kernel. It's the central component responsible for communication between hardware, software, and memory. All the process management, device management, memory management, interrupt handling, input-output operations, communications, file handling happens via the kernel. One way to remember this is that you have an operating system and you've got a kernel and then you've got applications that access the kernel via the operating system's GUI layer and the applications obviously also provide the user interface where the user accesses. So the diagram that you see on the bottom right hand corner is a great way of representing the relationships between the various different parts. So the user accesses the applications via the UI which obviously the operating system provides in a way and it's got a core which is the kernel and through the kernel you can access the CPU, the memory or the hardware so there is an indirect route from the user to the hardware via the operating system. Why is it that way? Why can't a user directly access the hardware? That's because accessing the hardware requires programming and coding and use of commands which might be quite complex for an average user to handle. So to simplify that we provide a user interface and that leads us to the next important part of this particular segment, a very common exam question, how does the operating system hide the complexities of the hardware from the users? So those four bullet points that you see on screen are of the utmost importance, make sure you jot these down. It does so by using a GUI interface rather than a command line interface through the use of device drivers which simplify the complexity of the hardware interface, simplifying the saving and retrieving of data from memory and storage devices, 
and carrying out background utilities such as wireless scanning which the user can leave to its own devices. The user doesn't really need to initiate it, it just happens over time it's scheduled. And the operating system can manage that. So if you want to kind of discuss an example, you can see that on screen, if you were using a command line interface, you would need to type a copy command such as copy C drive slash windows slash myfile.txt and you might need to specify a location where you want to save that file, which could be your A drive for a floppy disk drive in the old days or a D drive where you might have a USB pen drive connected to it. Now modern computers use a drag and drop method which removes any of the complexities of interfacing directly with the computer. So I don't need to type any of these commands or put further parameters. I can just simply click a file and drag it to where I want to and it just copies it for you. And that's how it hides the complexity of using a computer from the user to the use of a user interface. All the necessary processes, all the behind the scenes work is done by the operating system. Well, another task that an operating system allows is multitasking and it does that by managing processes or programs. So multitasking, if you don't know what it is, allows computers to carry out more than one task which is known as a process at a time. And a process is a program that has just been started to be executed by the CPU. Each of these processes will share common hardware resources. You use the same RAM, you probably use the same input-output devices, and of course, the same CPU. And you can get instances where you might have two processes trying to access RAM or the same input-output device or the CPU at the same time, and that can lead to a collision and which could lead to a crash. So to ensure that multitasking operates successfully, a scheduler is built into an operating system which manages access to these resources. In fact, the kernel overlaps the execution of each process based on a scheduling algorithm. And these scheduling algorithms can come in two flavors and they are called preemptive and non-preemptive. And these scheduling algorithms give the appearance that many processes are being carried out at the same time even though they are being processed one at a time. Now, in preemptive, processes are preemptive after each time quantum. That means the allowed amount that's given to them. And in non-preempted, processes are more rigid. That means that they are preempted after a fixed time amount. Now, what does that all mean? Well, let's just look at this particular table and see if that simplifies it for you. In preemptive, Resources are allocated to a process for a limited amount of time, whereas in non-preemptive, the resources are allocated to a process and the process retains them until it has completed its burst time or the process has switched to a waiting state. What does that mean? That means it cannot be interrupted, okay? Whereas preemptive can be interrupted. So that time quantum and that fixed time is basically flexible time versus rigid time. Now with preemptive, you get a benefit that when you get high priority processes arriving in the ready queue on a frequent basis, for example, if a system is crashing or you need to calculate something depending on other sensors and so forth, preemptive allows access to those high priority processes almost immediately. But the problem with that is that the low priority processes end up being starved of access and you might end up with a situation where they never get executed. However, in general, preemptive is the more flexible form of scheduling compared to non-preemptive which is very rigid, very controlled. So if a process with a long burst time is running in the CPU, there's a risk that another process which might be high priority, which might be, have a shorter burst time, is not allowed to run. So just remember that in preemptive, the time quantum could be even, it could be evenly distributed like every process gets 10 nanoseconds, that's the fixed time quantum, whereas in non-preemptive you might have different fixed time schedules, for example a process might end up getting 2 seconds on the CPU which is a lot of time and another process might be given a shorter burst time of 10 nanoseconds. So if the 2 second one is being executed first the nanosecond one has to wait for almost in computer time an eternity for it to get its own term and that could lead to lag in the user interface. Now low level scheduling comes into play here as well. 
because it decides which process should next get the use of CPU time, in other words, burst time. Now, following an OS call, which decides what the priority level is, processes can be in the ready state, and then if they are higher priority, they can be put into the running state. And its objectives are to maximize the system throughput. That means that we are using all the possible time that's available to us, and you don't have idle time on the CPU. This ensures that the response time is acceptable, ensure that the system remains stable at all times, has consistent behavior in its delivery or execution of various processes. And low-level scheduling resolves situations in which there are conflicts between two processes requiring the same resource. So it will probably say, well, okay, you wait here, you go first. So it acts like a traffic warden. Low-level scheduling uses interrupts, buffers, and queues to make sure that the states of the various different processes are saved. So for example, if a high priority process comes in, you will use an interrupt to identify it. You'll probably load it up into the states into a buffer, probably put processes in a queue. So all of these structures are utilized by low-level scheduling to ensure that you don't end up with a particular collision. Uh, there's an example on screen about two apps accessing a printer. And if they both try to access the printer at the same time, that could lead to a crash. However, through the use of interrupts, buffers, and queues, you could manage that situation really, really well. But what decides the priority level of a particular process? Well, that depends on its category. Is it a batch? Is it online? Is it a real-time process? Real-time process and online perhaps will get higher priority than batch process, which means that you need to do a lot of processing at one particular time. Whether the process is CPU bound or whether it is input output bound. For example, if you were executing a large calculation, you would need a long CPU time, but a shorter input output time. And similarly, if you are printing a large number of documents, you would require a short CPU cycle, but a very long input output cycle with the printer in particular. Then, of course, there's the resource requirements. Which resource does the process require and how many of those? For example, how much memory, how much CPU time or input output time, the turnaround time, waiting time and response time for a particular process. That's important as well. And whether the process can be interrupted during running, that helps decide the priority level as well. So it's a combination of different factors. And what's the right recipe? That depends on the algorithm, the manufacturer, and whoever's coding the operating system, they decide which factors get a higher priority than others. Once it's coded, the process scheduler just follows those instructions. Now, once a task or a process has been given a priority, it can still be affected by the deadline, for example, of the completion of the process, how much CPU time is needed when running the process, and the memory requirements of the particular process. For example, a process could be given a very high priority, but there's not enough memory available to run it or perhaps there's a long wait time present for the high priority level. So the process scheduler deals with all of these types of conditions. Now as such, a process scheduler deals with a lot of complexity and it needs to constantly move processes between the ready state, the running state, or the block state where a process is waiting for an input or something else perhaps. In order to do that, it needs the services of a process control block, PCB, which is basically a data structure which ends up containing all the data needed for a process to run. And this is normally created in memory or RAM. The PCB stores the current process's state. Is it ready? Is it running? Or is it blocked? The privileges of a particular process, for example, what resources it's allowed to access. For example, you might not want certain processes to access the input-output device. The register values like PC, MAR, MDR, and accumulator of course, a lot of times a process has to be loaded into the running state multiple times. So the last point of execution needs to be recorded. So these register values need to be remembered. The process priority and any other scheduling information is also stored here, along with the amount of CPU time the process will need to complete and the process ID, which allows it to be uniquely identified. So the PCB is kind of like a database or a table with a key field, which is the process ID. Now there are three main process states, which you need to remember, and these are the ready, running, and blocked states. So when a new program is initiated, it's admitted to the ready queue, 
and in the ready queue all the processes which are waiting for CPU time they are queued up based on their priority level. The scheduler then selects the first process to run that's loaded into the running state where the program is now run on a CPU so the process is being executed. Now if the process is finished in its allocated time slice then it's moved to the process completed or terminated queue it's finished we don't need to worry about it if for example it still needs to continue running then an interrupt is sent and it's moved back to the end of the queue in the ready state if while being in the running state the process has to wait for an event or an input output for it to be completed then it's moved to the blocked state and it will wait in the blocked state until that particular event or the input output operation is completed and once that event or input output operation occurs it is moved back into the ready state the scheduler handles all of these three states so it's moving processes based on priority between the ready states to the running state and if it's waiting for an event it then moves it to the block state or it moves it back into the ready state if it's completed its burst time and these cycles continue on. My suggestion is pause the video and just go through these states and understand how they are linked to each other. Another simple way of remembering these is in the form of a table that you see on screen that the process can go from a running state to a ready state if it finishes its time slice and when that time slice or burst time is completed an interrupt occurs and the program is moved to the ready queue. If you're in the ready state, how do you go to the running state? In that particular transition, a process's turn to use the processor comes up. The OS scheduler allocates CPU time to the process so it can be executed. If you're in the running state, how do you move to the block state? How does that transition happen? The process needs to carry out an input output operation. The OS scheduler places the process into the block queue because you need to wait for that input output or the results of some other process to arrive and you're not going to be hanging around in the running state you're going to be moved to the block state you're not going to be moved to the ready state either because you will end up jamming the queue so you just end up into this special queue so how does it move from the block state to the ready state what happens in that transition the process that was waiting for that input output resource once that's completed it's then moved to the ready state because it's now ready to run and be processed. Okay, we're going to stop here for this particular lesson. In the next lesson, we'll move on to discussing how the various different scheduling algorithms work. But for now, you should have a better understanding of how an operating system hides complexity from a user. You should also be clear about the role of the kernel, what the role of process management is in multitasking, how does low level scheduling work, and how the three processes states are linked with each other and what is included in the PCB. As usual, if you do have any questions, please do get back to me. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next lesson.